Welcome to the Nonprofit Network. I have something to say. I'm Gabriel Buelna here in uh, Los Angeles, California. Today we're interviewing Congressman Raul Grijalva from Southern Arizona. Some of you may, may, be, may be asking yourself, how is this Southern Arizona Congressman affecting my life? And I would say some of you saw the, the episode where we talked about immigration. Today we're going to be talking about the congressman's uh, history in the nonprofit world, his Iraq policy, Afghanistan policy, how this congressman predicted in a way the issue of the Gulf, uh, of the Gulf oil crisis and how this congressman is going to affect your life. Congressman, um, I, I haven't put too much pressure on you. No, uh, not at all. Okay, okay. Um, uh, do you have a solution for greenhouse gases? I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, no, I'm just Okay. Um, let's, let, let's talk about your background. Um, okay. Where, who are you? I was born in Tucson. My, all my family's there. And uh, uh, I, uh, we married, well, going on 40 years now, three daughters, a couple of grandkids who are great. And um, most of my work life and, and life uh, and political life as well has been uh, where I grew up in Arizona and in Tucson, Arizona. So you, you have uh, in, in, in Arizona, Arizona has obviously, it, it's a beautiful state. I mean, um, a lot of us may not have liked Barry Goldwater's politics, but his pictures are beautiful. And, but it's also a, a state with a lot of labor strife a lot of mining, a lot of agriculture. Um, you know, we're just talking about congressmen, uh, not about congressmen, about author Howard Zinn and uh, the book of People's History of the United States and Rudy Acuna's Occupied America. There's been a lot of strife in, you know, have, has your family lived through some of that strife? Well, yeah, I, I think uh, if you grew up in the borderlands and if you grew up uh, where I did in Southern Arizona, you were part of, uh, uh, the deportation of the striking miners in Bisbee, uh, most of them uh, Mexicanos. Uh, you were part of uh, the labor strikes that established uh, the mine mill workers, and, the, and they were predominantly uh, led by Latinos and, and predominantly the workforce, because we had three different tiers of pay, mm -hmm. depending on race, uh, and that was, that was changed. Uh, Tucson is, uh, they call it the birthplace of uh, uh, bilingual education, one of the first programs that are in the nation, uh, and it was also uh, it's also been a a place where uh, it's a melting pot place in in, in in the configuration of cultures there. You, you have the Mexican influence, which is powerful and strong. You have an equally powerfully and strong Native American uh, influence, and you have uh, the people that moved in, the settlers, and so you you mix all this together, and and you have a, a a region that is uh, filled with political history and uh, and filled with the tensions that come when you mix a lot of people together. Your your your, your history is, is actually very interesting. You were on the board of education. I think elected in, in what year first? God, seventy two. Way back when I was a twenty two year old man. A twenty two year old man. So you were on the board of education. Um, you have three daughters. Were you married at the time? Yeah. Three daughters. Um, then uh, you work in the nonprofit world. So uh, what nonprofit did you work in? Well, I, most of my work was in community development, and I worked uh, running a community center for, for many years. Uh, I also worked uh, as an assistant dean for students at the University of Arizona. I did some work at Pima Community College. At, uh, so it was uh, the nonprofit world is you kind of, uh, you kind of move with the times. And so I, I ended up working in a really good place with the city of Tucson for many years, and that was at a community center that I loved because it was uh, everything from adult basic education to arts, and there was a mix of things. Those in the nonprofit world, I, I'm asking these questions about the congressman because the congressman is in a tough re-election fight, but it's important to know that how, how someone develops their ideology, their thinking, their, and how did, how did, because you have opinions on the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, the environment, how did that experience from working in the nonprofit world lead to some of your political ideology? Uh, well, I, I think around the issues of uh, opportunity and poverty and uh, the elderly and the people we dealt with, the people that were uh, 
challenged because they had not received the kind of education that they should have. Uh, immigrants trying to learn English. You see, I saw you see that every day, and, and and it begins. You see the issues of abuse. You see children that are having all these problems um, in their lives because they don't have a structure and they don't have a family. And so you, it's not a question of empathy. You begin to say, okay, I can handle this one individual case, mm -hmm. but what about the thousands that I can't touch? But, but Congressman, you, you've gone from, um, from a history of, of serving, well, you might have worked in tough neighborhoods, but um, uh, your office has been shot at, um, you have been threatened, Mm -hmm. Your family has been threatened. Um, this is to have to have an emotional uh, effect that you know the, the, that you probably thought I didn't sign on for this. Well, yeah, you 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 say well, uh, I I think you believe that uh, the disagreements in a, in a in a democracy like ours are, are civil, but they're not, and uh, it, it's disconcerting. I don't know if it's uh, you know. No, you don't sign up to, to have your life threatened or your family's life threatened, but uh, if, you, if, if you kind of get at the point of the spear and talk about issues that, that you, you create opposition in, sometimes that opposition is very intense, and, and sometimes you have some wing nuts that just take that opposition to a next level. Let me, let me just ask you from a very, from a very personal uh, perspective, has it been worth it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's been uh, one of the most uh, intellectually and uh, personally challenging things I've ever done. I think all of us in, in, in whatever life we choose or whatever profession or endeavor we choose, uh, the idea that drives us is the challenge. And so this has been challenging. And, and we're now going to move to you, you back in February of 2010. Um, requested and had issues with the oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. What is your thinking on the day of the oil, that the oil spill began? Oh, it was, uh, uh, we were a little bit angry that we had for, for a couple of weeks uh, had uh, in listening to a whistleblower that said that not all the boxes were being checked, that, that the inspections by the agency were, were not being done. That the, that the company essentially was inspecting itself, that corners were being cut, and that there was a potential for something bad to happen, particularly in the deep water uh, drilling. Uh, so when uh, Horizon blew up, uh, we had asked about Atlantis, because that's where the issue came up, and we had asked, let's inspect all these rigs. Uh, there were, I think the initial reaction wasn't some gloating, I told you so, it was a catastrophe of huge environmental proportions, and uh, we were angry that but, nobody had listened to that request. But, but Congressman, right now, is there any rig that you know of that could explode and that you're worried about? No, of course not. Of course not. Okay. Of course not. That, uh, that you know, that's, uh, that, that would involve some sort of infallibility that I don't have, but uh, 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 no, I, uh, that's, that's not the point, though. The point is, we have an obligation as a government to oversight and inspect these rigs. And we haven't been doing the job. And if it requires for us to suspend activities for a while in order to make sure that everything is perfectly OK in the Gulf or any, in any offshore drilling, we should do it. Now, in the news, you, you, you hear of, um, of scientists that are being quieted for saying that the oil is at the bottom of the of the ocean, essentially, it sank. Mm -hmm. What it, what do you believe should happen with regard to cleaning that oil? Is I, it, you know the, the the first step, and and, and the person on my staff, um, uh, we're going to ask for this, and I don't know if there's enough time because the session's almost over, is to bring in those scientists to a hearing in front of my subcommittee, uh, so that we can get this information out. A is the current administration doing enough? to clean up, to put pressure on BP to, uh, to clean up? I, I think they, I think uh, Secretary Salazar, sometimes my wife says, sometimes you, you're, you shouldn't get what you wish for. And, and, I, okay. and to some extent, even though that was a position I, uh, I was considered for, I, 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 I think uh, Secretary Salazar did the best he could under some horrible situations. I wouldn't, uh, I think we listen too much to the industry. The industry has been in charge of this since 2005. They took, the agency has already been exposed as being corrupt 
and in being in bed with the industry? Have we done enough to shake that up and start to change that whole culture? Uh, beginning right after the spill, yes, things are moving. Let's switch out because we, we don't have that much time. Let's switch to the war in Afghanistan and, 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 and Iraq. Um, are you pleased with what is going on uh, right now in, in, in the role the administration is taking in winding down the war? I'm glad, I'm glad the administration is keeping its war, uh, word on Iraq. Uh, I, I believe we should have a much more firm and explicit exit strategy mm -hmm. for Afghanistan, which we don't have. I think those are quagmires. Both have been quagmires for us. It's the longest wars we've ever been involved in. Uh, 5,000 of our, our, our human treasure has been lost. 1.1 trillion of our, uh, our capital treasure has been lost. And by the way, that's added to the deficit because that's not paid for any other way. Uh, and so it's a quagmire. We knew it. And now you see Iraq unraveling as we leave. You see Afghanistan unraveling as we begin to pull back. Uh, I, I always felt that once we made a unilateral decision to go in, uh, that I opposed that. And I continue to oppose it. And I wish there was an exit strategy for Afghanistan that was much faster and did not require us to continue to have a presence there. You were against going into Afghanistan? Yeah. Um, now, that we're, now that we're there, because uh, uh, the administration was, you know, it was kind of the Iraq war was bad, the Afghanistan war, not that the war was good, but yeah, it was the that's war. That's right. Um, what is, at least Iraq has oil, you know, in terms of income coming in. If, if we leave Afghanistan too quickly, do we not, uh, without, it doesn't have a port, and most people may or may not know that Afghanistan is landlocked. What economic policies does I, Afghanistan have to survive as a nation? Well, let, let, let's, let's, uh, let's, take, let's put some historical context to it. Uh, Afghanistan, you know, if, um, if uh, Alexander the Great couldn't keep that country under control, if the British couldn't, if the Russians couldn't, if Genghis Khan went out of his way not to go through Afghanistan, then I think history should teach us a lesson that that is not an area of the world in which a foreign presence is going to be tolerated or where you can have a foreign presence. What is the economy of Afghanistan? What was it before we got there? And what's it going to be in the future? I don't want to be cruel about this. But the, the, our national interest has been compromised more by being in Afghanistan and Iraq in terms of the Middle East and security than by us not being there. I don't know what the consequence will be after we leave. I just know that whatever mess is going to happen after we leave is going on right now while we're there. Our presence has not in one iota, I disagree with the administration, made us more secure or made the region more secure by having a presence in Afghanistan. So a, a lot of, especially, you know, um, and, and I hate to say I have three daughters, you have three daughters, our daughters would not be treated well in Afghanistan. Um, okay. If, if, if the U.S. military leaves, a lot of, 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 um, of individuals are worried about how women will be treated and how things will go back. Do we not have a responsibility to those women? We, we have a responsibility to the nation and to the women. There's a difference between, there's, you, there's a difference between nation building where you come in and provide assistance for the development and the growth of that nation, and there's a difference between nation building where you do it by uh, boots on the, uh, on the ground, i.e. the military. I think the sec first strategy of diplomatic and development assistance is the way to go. I think the military presence creates a scenario that when we leave, things will get worse. Congressman, in, 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 we have 20, you have 20 seconds to tell, 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 tell the country why, they, why you matter in their life. Uh, I think it's about common sense. It's about uh, a history that is not uh, jaded by uh, growing up with a silver spoon in my mouth. And I think that uh, there's still a place in American government and in politics uh, for honesty and truth. And there's still a place in American government for and politics for uh, taking a risk and taking a stand. Uh, we've become too cautious. We, we read too many polls. 
and the instincts to do right for this American people has been lost. I think I'm different, and that's why I continue to press the case.